the reason when you look back at, at the whole world of, of hyperconvergence, most of which were just doing virtual storage for VMware, we had this different angle that AI ops backend could keep things running when they went wrong in the absence of you sitting there in front of it was extremely helpful. Hello and welcome to episode 79 of Great Things with Great Tech, the podcast highlighting companies doing great things with great technology. My name is Anthony Spiteri and in this episode we're talking to a company that was founded during the birth of the hyper-converged infrastructure industry with a story marked by steady growth, strategic partnerships and a commitment to customer-centric solutions. This company has carved a niche in the evolving IT landscape of virtualization and in the year of 2024 has renewed vigor given everything that's happening in this crazy world. That company is Scale Computing. I'm joined today by Jeff Reddy, the co-founder and CEO of Scale Computing. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Anthony. Excellent. No worries. Just to give a bit of a shout out to the show, as a reminder, if you like great things with great tech and would like to feature in future episodes, you can click on the link on the show notes or go to gtwgt.com. As a reminder, all episodes are up on the website. They're on YouTube and on all good podcasting platforms, Apple, Spotify, all hosted and distributed by Spotify Podcasts. All right, Jeff, I rushed through that because I want to get to the meat of, you know, why we're talking to Scale Computing today. But I think like all episodes, it's, it's really good to get a background about yourself, where you started, um, and then obviously talk about the, the founding of Scale Computing. But, you know, to start off with, just give us a bit of a background about yourself and how you came to be in this great industry. Sure. Uh, so you know, I am I am probably the definition of a serial entrepreneur. I've been starting companies um, since I was eleven. I've had a I've had a company continuously operating since I was eleven. Wow, that, that could um, be a record. I don't think I've ever had. Yeah, maybe. Say 11, I don't eh? know. Maybe. <laughs> um, you know, and I uh, and, and most of them have been tech. Not all. You know, when I was eleven, I was mowing lawns. But by the time I was thirteen, I was building computers. Um, and so awesome. I've been I've been in tech forever. The, um, you know, I'm a computer science by, by university training. Um, so I can, I can talk all the tech, although I, I was once deemed the worst programmer on the team, which is how I got this job. So, hey, um, you, so you somebody had what? to sell it, right? So far we're kind of lined up. I mean, I don't, I don't run like multi-million dollar <laughs> companies, but I, I definitely was building computers when I was like 13, 15. And I definitely went to uni, went to computer science, but it was a horrible, horrible programmer. So there you go. So we kind of matched <laughs> yeah, up yeah. a little bit, at least on that part. Yeah, I was always the guy who was the, you know, the team lead and the group that had to talk to the professor while the other guys did the did the real work. But but yeah, I do yeah. know how it all works. Um, yeah. So I've got that. And then, you know, kind of coming out of university, I, I started a um, an internet service provider back in the early, this was dial-up modem days. This was a long time ago. So I was in the ISP business. Um, I started uh, one of the very first companies that did online advertising in the 90s, um, okay. and we did ads in, in software programs, which we would now call apps, but they weren't called apps back then. Um, so I apologize for that. But then um, after we did that, I started a company in the email security space, specifically anti-spam. Uh, okay. So we used um, neural networks and natural language processing to identify and filter junk email. Ironically, nearly the same technique that's used by chat GPT today, except 30 or 25 year old technology. What, so what was what was that company called? That company was called um, Corvigo. Um, okay. We were around about two years and then we got acquired by a, a public company um, called Tumbleweed Communications. It was also yeah. an email security. I, um, um, yeah, it's funny because I just just to sort of take off there. I mean, I, I dealt like we talked about before working in hosting early on. I, that was one of my first gigs was working with a, a company called Mailguard that was in Australia, which basically did the same thing, right? So yeah, it was kind of, and that was what, 20, 20 yeah, over 20 years ago. So almost the same time frame. But yeah, to, crazy to think that you were using names were like, you know, the machine learning kind of componentry that's so popular today. I've, I've come across that with a few guests over the last, you know, 12 months that have sort of said, oh yeah, we, we, we definitely did AI before, before it was a thing, but it definitely was. Yeah, as I say, it was AI before it was cool. Yeah, so. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> So yeah, go on, go on. Yeah, yeah. So so we had that company, and and that company, um, you know, we sold that that product as an appliance. So th this was, um, you know, to your own your own background, right? This was when people mostly ran their own exchange servers, and so yeah. it was an appliance you would sit physically in front in, from a network topography standpoint in front of the exchange server, and it got rid of the ju the junk email before it ever made it there. 
And um, so that was that got me into kind of the, the world of appliance type IT. Um, mm-hmm. And so from there, when that when that company was acquired, we I, I spent some time at the company that um, that acquired us, obviously. And um, the uh, one of the one of the weird things that happens you know, because they were public. So when when that acquisition happened, um, it was it was very public that I'd sold the company. And, you know, and me and all the other founders were being uh, bombarded by every money manager, wealth manager, all, all, all under the false impression that we got all the money, which is not how this works, but, um, I wish it was, but it is not how this works. But, but, um, so then we decided, Hey, we could use the, we could use our AI backgrounds and we should use the same kind of, you know, techniques and we'll do stock market forecasting and we'll Ooh, be our okay. own wealth managers. Right. So yeah. we, uh, so we started kind of a science project that, that grew and grew. Um, and we were using, you know, again, different kinds of AI algorithms to uh, do stock market analytics, and it, and it worked, and it was working pretty well. And we decided we were going to turn that into a real business, um, which meant we had to be a hedge fund. So we were going to take other people's money and and huh. use this algorithm. Um, and so so we started down that road. And what I learned, what I learned was all the the Hollywood movies that you see about Wall Street and all like how shady and squirrely it all seems it's all true as far as i can I was, tell i was gonna say <laughs> um, this is a leading i mean i know scale was founded in 2007 eight. i mean i'm just you know something happened around that time as well so I'm like, yeah yeah it, <laughs> yeah the, the, and so we 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 hit the we aborted right we, we actually there were six of us involved and we had an offer to to bring in about 20 million dollars of investment capital into that business and but but that was it was going to be real before that was all our own money right so yeah. it, you know and if you made money one day or lost money the next day it, it you know i mean it hurt us but it wasn't like the, it wasn't with somebody else's money yes um and so we we took a silent vote to see who was you know, yes or no and we everybody unanimously like no and, and the thing was and i learned a lot about myself in that process is that the technology was really cool right i mean i love the, the tech part of it but the business was kind of lame right? It, you weren't really solving anybody's problem. You know, the customers didn't care how it worked. They didn't care. It, it, they didn't feel better because you did it. It was just like you made a money or you lost money. Right. And and that was it. And that wasn't, that wasn't fun. Right. Like going all the way back to when I was 11, it was always, there was a product, there was somebody that had yeah. a problem you were trying to fix it. Right. It's kind of the engineering Interesting mindset. Interesting psyche. So. Yeah. I get you. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so when we shut that down, we decided, okay, we need to do something else. And over the time, we had built an entire infrastructure. Um, again, this was all grassroots, our own our own stuff. So we had a, a, a computing engine and a storage engine and all the, this that, that we couldn't afford to buy from the market. And you know, people wanted millions and millions of dollars for the kind of stuff that, that we put together. And so we it was all homegrown. And, and we thought, well, surely other people would want this kind of infrastructure that we built for ourselves. And in, in effect, um, that infrastructure was a direct competitor to what I loosely call VMware, right? VMware being the quote unquote operating system, if you will, yeah. for the data center. Um, so we had our own software stack that was that operating system. And then the componentry that, that feeds into an infrastructure. So the network, the storage, the compute, all of that. And um, so literally my first business plan was a, what was one sentence that said compete with VMware right now at the time VMware had just gone public and yeah. you know, they had 98% market share and we thought, well, okay, perfect. They got to have some com- competition. <laughs> right. And so that's, that was the, the genesis of it. And you know, that the, the interesting thing, and there's a little bit of an entrepreneurial story in there, which is, you know, I thought what we would take to market initially was the full solution, right? Everything that we had put together. And I started, um, and I recommend anybody do this if you're starting a company, right? I, I always, I always start making sales calls before we even have any actual product, right? And so knowing it's we were going to compete with VMware, it's typical, that we, isn't it? That's that's not 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 outrageous that in terms of a strategy. Yeah, no, no. I mean, that's you. You know, I always say customers have all the answers, right? And and they also, you know, have most of the questions. You just haven't discovered them yet, right? So. Yeah. So I went to literally me and, and one of my co-founders went to VMware's website. They nicely had a whole bunch of case studies listed. And those are the people I called, right? Like, okay, these are their top customers. Let me call them. And, and my pitch was, hey, I've got, um, I've got something, I'm working on something that's 
quote unquote, exactly like VMware, but it'll be 30% cheaper, right? What do you think? Nobody was interested, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing. And, and I, I finally, I got a guy on the phone. Um, it was a law firm out in California and I, he, he was really being very open with me. And so I said, okay, what if it was 50% cheaper? No, probably not. And I finally <laughs> got to the point. I said, what if it was free? Right. What if I had everything VMware had, but it was free. And he said, I probably still wouldn't do it. And I thought, <laughs> well, yeah. You know, and, and I asked him, I said, well, how much did you spend on VMware? Um, you know, he's like, about, it's about $200,000 a year um, for them. And I thought, how, how could you say no to free? And um, I said, okay. And I was puzzled and I was thinking, and I said, well, what else are you spending on? He's like, well, we just built a new data center. And um, he's like, and that's how I know exactly what we're spending on VMware, because that was part of this new data center. And I said, oh, well, what all went into the data center? He's like, he rattles off all these components. It was a, it was a $20 million build. And the light bulb went off in my head. And I said, I thought, oh, I, you know, what I think I'm asking this guy is, can I save you 100% of $200,000? And what he's hearing me ask is, can I save him 1% of $20 million? Mm -hmm. Right. And I said, well, what else is in there? And he, he goes, you know, he's like different components. What's the most expensive thing in the data center? He said, oh, data storage, for sure. That was like 70% of the cost. And I said, what if I could save you 30% on your data storage? And he said, I'd write you a check right now. <laughs> I said, okay, all right, that's the key. And we had that, right? Because we had the whole solution. And so we went to market with data storage, which turned out to be um, hyperconvergence, right? I mean, that, that led straight into the world of hyperconvergence. It didn't have a name then, right? Yeah. Um, but that was the idea. So, 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 so just backing, backing up a little bit because it's quite interesting. So number one, I love the, the hard pivot from stock brokerage platform to, <laughs> to, to what becomes scale. That's, yeah. that's a great, that's one of the best pivots that I've had on the show. Love it completely. Um, I want to, and we're, we're foreshadowing a bit of the conversation around Broadcom and VMware afterwards. I think you made a really good point though. Part of what you, what you were trying to, trying to sort of convince that, that customer you know, twenty percent, fifty percent. I'll give it to you away for free. Sorry, VM. We've got VMware. A even though the whole concept was around the data center, I think right. that's the that's the pull that VMware had that was that good. That even if you're offering stuff for free, people understood that it still wasn't worth it because it was that good. You know, in right. the market. Right. So I think that's an interesting point to touch on a little bit later on when we get into what's happening now, right? And and, and what's yep. going on. Um. So 2007, you, you kind of found the company. 2008, you, you incorporated the company. Um, and then it wasn't until 2010 that you launched the hyperconverged software and appliance. Um, so is that, what was it to start with? You mentioned storage, but from the start, what componentry was it? And, and was it just, was it a box that you put in to a data center? So just it explain was, what so scale computing is there. Correct, yeah. So the initial product was a scale-out SAN. Right. It okay. was, you know, we, they were, it was a, a series of, of primarily one and two U pizza box servers that you could, and hence, you know, you could stack up and, and sort of start small and add to it over time and have a, a clustered SAN effectively. Um, and, you know, that, that was always meant to be a gateway into, into again, what sort of became the, the first version of hyperconvergence. Otherwise, I would have had a really dumb name for a storage company, right? Scale computing <laughs> isn't a great name yeah. for a storage company, but that that's where the market took us, right? Like they they people yeah, yeah. wanted that storage yeah. component, and um, and so that's what we we launched with. And then a couple of things happened, right? It turned out this was around the time that um, you you had a big price war in the storage market around 2010 between EMC it. and Dell, yeah. um, and and it became very difficult, right? As a startup, you know, I mean, no investor ever wants you to say, hey, our advantage is price. But as a startup, your one of the advantages has to be price almost mm -hmm. every time, right? I mean, there's some exceptions, but Technology when you're going into a mature market, yeah, yeah, I mean, you have to get people's attention, right? And so, so we had a pricing advantage. And when the, that the margins collapsed in that market, that's a bad spot for an early stage company to be. Um, you know, it, it's, it's hard enough to make a business on 50% margins. And if the margins go to 10%, you're, yeah. you're never going to make it right. 
And so we said, okay, well, here, now is the time to launch what has been the, the underlying product the whole time, uh, which was the idea of combining uh, the compute and the storage and importantly, uh, the virtualization stack together in one, right? Yeah. That was the idea. And that, you know, that and going all the way back to the stock market, you know, system we set up, the, the realization we had then was that, you know, a storage device, a SAN is a dedicated server, right? Just for mm -hmm. storage. So you had a server, then you had a special server for a SAN, you have another special server for network called a, a you know, a switch, um, which is again, just the next 86 server doing yeah. something special. And at one point in computing, the CPU was the bottleneck. And so you had to separate all these things out to make it work. And CPUs got fast enough that they weren't the bottleneck. If you looked at the CPU on your typical SAN, it was a, a tenth of a percent was being used. And so we thought, well, we practically said, well, we, we don't need to buy servers. We should just run the application on that same device. Yeah. And that, that sort of became the impetus for hyperconvergence. And what, you know, the, the irony, right, I, I think that, you know, of all the companies in, in HCI, uh, mo most of which have gone away, um, yeah. some of us are still around, but, you know, Nutanix is the most well-known, right? And Nutanix existed first, similar to us, as just storage for VMware, Our right? Memory. I mean, it, yeah. they, they, did, they didn't even position themselves as HCI. It was, you know, they had a, a logo that said SAN with a slash through it, like no SAN. Um, and so... Uh, I have the the dubious honor at this point, I guess, of being the person who coined the term hyperconvergence, which was ironically meant to differentiate us from Nutanix, right? Which <laughs> seems ridiculous now, yeah. but but the the term meant or was originally to mean converged infrastructure. So you may remember at that time, converged infrastructure was a thing, right? It was the idea that you would put all the components in one rack, right, yep. and you'd have everything running. So it's converged infrastructure inclusive of the hypervisor. That's what it meant, right? So the hyper meant hypervisor converged infrastructure. It just sounded cooler to say hyper converged infrastructure. Yeah. Right. And that was something that we did that at the time Nutanix did not do, right? So we had our own um, virtualization stack, our own storage stack, all combined into one, and we sold it as. I had one to go appliance. back and think about it, right? Because I, you know, I mean, initially. Yeah, Nutanix was storage, and, and I've actually almost put that out of my 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 memory. The fact that right. it was only after the fact that they you know announced their their hypervisor competitor mm -hmm. to because they could because much like what you're saying, it's like well we're doing all the storage, we've we've got crazy compute resources, getting better every year. Um, you know the hardware's getting that good. We can we can do something here. We can push the limits of the hardware to actually get more and actually carve our own niche here, and that's exactly what they did. And um, before that, it was just like vSAN versus Nutanix. That's what it was, right? right. Like it was, and that was a, the hyperconverged componentry in itself. And there right. was a massive outrage. And must, you know, when Nutanix brought out their hypervisor, Acropolis, it was like, whoa, what, what are they doing? They can't do this. Like they're, th they're, they're threatening VMware's dominance here. And then it became a bit of a holy war. And then I guess you guys just kind of sat back and kind of went, we're going to let this all play out a little bit, right? Because We've got we've got a same same play here, but I mean your your hypervisor like I guess like Acropolis as well. It's KVM based, right? Correct. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 I'd I'd like to think that Nutanix copied us, right? Like when we had that that out there. Um, but right, it, it's not you know I mean copying is good flattery, but it's not like they'd be oblivious to the same thing that we saw, which is hey, not not everybody wants the the VMware stack. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's it, it's a it's a thing. And, and and one of the things that um, that was and still is unique to scale, and this was sort of the impetus for the entire company, is that the entire product is built on going back to my my AI roots. Right. It's built on an AI ops foundation. Right. And, and the idea is um, we can I mean, AI is all pattern recognition. Right. I mean, we I think anyone in tech recognizes that's what it is. Um, and so what we knew is that, hey, in an IT infrastructure, troubleshooting IT is all about pattern recognition. If you're an IT administrator, 
you see what's going on, you're looking for the patterns, and then you try and take different actions to fix it, right? Um, same as troubleshooting a car, for that matter, right? It's the same kind of thing. And so we built this engine to monitor thousands of different things in an IT environment and look for the patterns that indicate something's happening and then have a system which can take action to fix it, right? This has nothing to do with hyperconvergence, but this is this is in this has been in this was in the original storage product. This was in the hyperconverged product, and this is in our, our, our all of our products today. And it shows up to a customer as it's self-healing, it's easy to use, it's all of these sorts of things. And and so that that unique element is always how we differentiate ourselves from uh, primarily VMware, but also Nutanix, which is it had this kind of self-healing capability. Yeah, which is interesting, right? Because if you ask about, you know, what's your problem statement and what's your value prop, I'd, I'd say that would be it compared to what I know about VMware and Nutanix and others out there. Yeah, VMware, uh, as great as it was, as is, um, lots of overheads in terms of, you know, th th there's a reason why you needed VMware ad admins, right? Um, stuff could go wrong. Um, there was not the concept of it being self-healing probably what still doesn't really exist today. It's, it's, it's just not there. Which is kind of interesting, given how popular it is and how accepted it is. It's 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 a strange one. I've I've been thinking about this a lot over the past couple of months since the Broadcom stuff. Like, how did they get themselves to a position where they just de facto themselves? Um, it was through a lot of good community. They really won the community over. So there's an element of that to it as well, which obviously I yep. I, I fell into. It's it's that's my world. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting point to make. Is that it, it wasn't the easiest. Um, and it wasn't the most bug free, but it, it still dominated while you had solutions like yours, which were doing this, you know, point differentiator around the self healing and through your roots, which probably people just didn't understand. I mean, they're, they're understanding it now I'm getting like they're understanding right. the value prop now, which is, you know, it's being thrown onto you literally. Uh, we'll get onto that a little bit later on. But just before we get to 2024, I mean, over the next few years, I mean, how did you kind of navigate you know, from the from the start, um, 2012, 2015, and through, you know, I guess leading into COVID and 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 how that kind of impacted the company. I I noticed that in 2019 you had you opened a mayor offices, and that must have been interesting as well, given what happened with COVID. But you know, what what was scale computing basically doing in these years up until 2022, 23, 24? Well, you know, I think what's the reason when you look back at, at the whole world of, of hyperconvergence, of which there were probably 50 companies at one point at the peak of, of all that, most of which were just doing virtual storage for VMware. That's yeah. what most of them did. Um, you know, Nutanix was the dominant player, so they survived. And, and we were, right, we had this different angle, right, this angle with that AI ops back end. And so, it, you know, it lent itself very well into environments that, you know, maybe you had limited IT staff or limited IT staff per site, you know, a, a construction company with a thousand employees, but 20 job sites and five IT people, right? That AI system that could keep things running when they went wrong in the absence of you sitting there in front of it was extremely helpful to them. And so we kind of carved ourselves a, a niche within, um, you know, mid-market companies, lower enterprise companies, remote offices, those kinds of things. Um, and, and so we were, right, unlike Nutanix, for example, that went very heavy into VDI, VDI was one of our use cases, but it was not, I mean, our primary use case was was literally like moving from VMware to scale. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, you know, I had 100 applications, I'm now running them on scale because I want that ease of use. I want that, that self-healing. And for us, it became... It was frustrating you know, as a founder, right? Because I could see, um, I could see companies like Nutanix and others like exploding, right? We kind of writing, you know, writing even a little bit on the coattails of VMware, yeah. where we were more slow and steady, right? Like, okay, we'd find the customers, they'd come to us. I wasn't raising five hundred million dollars. I wasn't, you know, doing that kind of thing. We just kept growing, but you know, we, we were building a reputation within that group that that we could do this, and. Then as things started flaming out, we just kept going, right? It wasn't any, really any different for us. When, when COVID hit, um, that really kind of opened up the world for the idea of remote work, right? Yes. And, and that the IT team wouldn't necessarily, they couldn't, maybe couldn't even go into the data center, right? So, um, so that, that 
it gave us some uh, some tailwinds in terms of the kind of things that that we did. Mm-hmm. Now it had business challenges, right? I opened an office in EMEA in 2019. I I opened an office in San Francisco in February of 2020. Yeah, okay. um, which Funny. is the whole you know it sat for <laughs> years empty, right? And yeah. so, um, but you know, we were we continued to expand, and um, you know, one thing that we did that's um, less different than Nutanix, but more different than what a lot of the other HCI guys did is we went 100% through uh, the channel resellers and MSPs and so forth, right from the get go, we were always a channel company. And, you know, it's a big investment up front. But as it starts to work, then then you become part of their practice, and they have relationships with customers, especially right when you when you look at we're focusing on those midsize accounts at the time, very, I mean, it's a very fragmented market, very hard to reach them, but they may, ha- they'll have a local partner of some kind who they trust, and that's who can get us in the door. So, um, so that's, that's what we did. And we kind of went through all of that, obviously, early COVID, everybody was freaking out, but then, then it became, it became kind of a, a big boost to us, really. Yeah. So. And what about Edge? Because you've, on your, on your site, a lot of your messaging is around Edge and being successful around there and being the right solution for Edge. Can you, can you explain that and why, why scale is good for Edge? Yeah, so so the one thing that, that you know started to happen really, I first probably started seeing it in maybe 2021, 2022 is you know the idea that that companies were deploying infrastructure at the you know way outside the data center, which became known as edge computing. So that you know on a truck, on a ship, in a yeah. restaurant, these kinds of places. And the thing about those environments is they're a lot more like the construction company than they are. a a big global data center, right? I mean, there's nobody there. And and so the AI piece to keep things running in the absence of a human being able to physically touch equipment um, was very handy. The other thing, which was always just a nice to have with scale, um, but worked very well for Edge is that our entire stack, um, again, maybe because I'm a computer science guy and I care about, you know, elegant code and, and, and stuff like this, but it's extremely lightweight. Right. So like, I mean, this is an Intel NUC, right? So our, our entire system will run on this hyperconvergence, the virtualization stack, everything, and we'll consume, you know, a gig of Ram and a 10th of a CPU core. And, Mm -hmm. you know, in the data center that meant, well, maybe you need to buy a few, a few less servers, which is nice, but out of the edge where you need to run on something like this, it's a big deal. Right. And so we just lent itself very well to that kind of environment. And also VMware was weak there. Right. So as a VMware alternative, um, all of the things I just said about scale don't really apply to VMware. And so customers, even if they were running VMware in their core data center, they were more open to running something else out at the edge. And with that, I mean, you've got the Intel nook there. Is, do you do the, um, the other um, chipsets and everything as well? Have you got compatibility with that or we don't we, yeah we, we we do in the lab we don't have any customers running the arm stuff mm. yet um although i expect that's coming right you know it, it started off as sort of raspberry pi type you know experiments yeah, ev- but with the nvidia sure. arm stuff there, there's more coming i mean certainly a big driver for edge is ai um and and you know it's very expensive to run gpus in the cloud and yes. so uh, and, and so that that that's another application that lends itself well to edge computing and that's a big big focus area for us yeah so you got like in terms of the the products you got the sc platform the the hypercore as well so you know, just explain those two and then we'll spend the last sort of 10 minutes talking about the the elephant in the room but yeah let's let's yeah, just yeah. finish so, up talking about the tech. Yeah. yeah so the product the product overall is called sc platform um a, a platform for running applications the the operating system that runs on the equipment is called Hypercore, and an operating system is what contains the um, the AI engine, the hyperconverged storage, the virtualization stack, all those things. And then that that ties into a component, an optional component, but most customers now are using it called Fleet Manager, which is a central portal through which you can control all of your environments, Beautiful. right? Whether whether you have one system or whether you have ten thousand. And, and the idea is that, you know, we want to be able to turn your entire fleet into something that looks and behaves like a private cloud, mm-hmm. um, yeah, yeah. because yeah. even if it's two systems, right, that's okay, right? You can yeah. still manage it centrally and deploy applications and do infrastructure as code and all that kind of stuff. That's awesome. Um, I haven't, and, and what about the, the networking component? Is it, is it, is that obviously, that's obviously built in, but do you have something that is uh, what would be equivalent to what was NICERA NSX? 
I, yeah, in a in a in a lighter weight version, right? I, we wouldn't have everything that that had, right? Yeah. But again, the kinds of customers and environments we're going into typically don't need it. Um, so you do have networking stuff in there. You can even just, you know, in in some edge environments, you directly connect these things to each other because then then you yeah. don't need a switch, right? So it'll basically do its own networking um, internal. Uh, so you've got a, a number of different options there, but um, but yeah, so it's all built in. Yeah, and, and to that point, your point, you know. Uh, that was a, a huge acquisition and a huge bit of technology, which I think was retrofitted forcefully um, from a <laughs> from a operational point of view and also just from a from a revenue point of view to a lot of customers. Right? It's like, well, now you're going to use it um, because we have to kind of realize the the investment that we made in the in the product. Right? As great as it was and as forward thinking as it was, it it did feel like it was pushed on a lot of people there and was definitely sure. overkill um, for what it was. So. Yeah, sim- there's, there's something to be said for a simple networking stack as well. That's for sure. Um, all right, so let's 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 finish off talking about this Broadcom scenario because obviously, you know, it's 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 it hasn't. I didn't plan it this way, but you know, I had XCP on G- NG on in the last episode. Um, I don't think you'll be the last sort of virtualization company they have on this year, obviously as well. But you know, what's your whole take on the whole Broadcom scenario? I mean. Obviously, we know that it has been impactful. We talked about this earlier. I think in, in the space of two weeks, I've gone from, oh, this is a bit of FUD and this might pass to this is actually quite a serious inflection point in the world of virtualization, which is good news for, you, for, for companies like you. It's like you've kind of been here ready to go um, for this particular moment for all of your existence, right? So what, what's, right. Your, what's your thoughts around it? Well, it, yeah, I mean, from a business standpoint, it's obviously great for us. Um, there's been, uh, e- even I being in the throes of this, and, and we started to see, you know, benefit even right after the, the acquisition was announced, which was over a year ago now. Uh, we started seeing a lot more inquiries into what we were doing and, and so forth. But then once the deal closed and Broadcom started taking actual actions and changing the way pricing worked, changing the way they work with their partners, um, taking customers direct away from partners, um, there, there's there been a enormous increase in uh, demand, both from the end user side as well as the partner side. I mean, just this January versus last January, we've had a 500% increase in uh, in uh, inbound uh, leads. Yeah. So I mean, it's, it, it's that is a huge, it's huge enormous, number. right? Because yeah. and we're an established company, right? And it's not like yeah. we're a startup. That would, you know, this is it's you know my expectation was that we would grow about thirty percent, which is what we typically grow, right? And now, I mean, it could be double, triple. I don't know. It, it's it's huge. the The thing is, and I, I think this is what caught everybody off guard. Even even kind of maybe lulled me into uh, being caught off guard is that historically. Broadcom has made acquisitions and focused those acquisitions on on literally their top 600 customers, right? They openly state this. 90% yeah. of their revenue comes from 600 customers. They did it with Symantec, they did it with Computer Associates. But then when they announced the Broadcom deal, they they were saying the things that would lead you to believe maybe that's not going to be the case. Yes. They, they want the SMB customers. They believe in the channel. They're going to continue to invest in R&D. And so everybody's like, well, all right, maybe this one will be different. And then as Mm. soon as it was done, they did all the same stuff that it right out of the manual or whatever, right. That they make, Mm. and and they'll make money with this, right. I mean, don't, I'm not bashing their business model. Like they will hundred percent, they've made money with Symantec. They'll do well, but it does create, if you're not in that 600 customer group, it's easy to be disenfranchised, right. Mm. I've seen customers show me quotes where they've gone up 20 times in terms of like how the, the expense, right? It'll be advertised as a price reduction, but it's only a price reduction if you had exactly the right components and exactly the right mix. Otherwise now it it costs more. I, I had partners tell me that they had, you know, I had one partner had over a thousand customers taken away from them and wow. taken direct to uh, to Broadcom. That's going to cost them half a billion dollars, right? That's, and that's yeah, it, which is, it, yeah. And, and so as, as going back to my entrepreneurial roots and, and having been an, an ISP and, and having worked with partners and built my whole business around partners, like that's actually kind of painful personally for me to watch. Yeah, like knowing that, yeah. it, it's hard. It hurts, yeah. right? Like I think I yeah. like, like I know, like, you know, when I think about stuff that I was building and services that I was responsible for and 
then the natural evolution of the cloud meant that, you know, potentially customers were taken away because of that. And then we were having customers who were saying, okay, well, we're going to migrate you off. We're going to pay for 24 months worth of licenses. You just come with us, right? And I'm not going to yep. mention the company that did that, but it's quite a big company in the world. Um, yep. But, you know, there's a, there's an element of hurt there that you definitely feel. And it's it's disappointing because I think that also speaks to, if I can t- go back to the first comment you made around having that conversation with the customer, talking about the discount, you know, there was a reason why he said no a number of times because he believed in what VMware was as an entity, as a partnership, right. as a relationship, as a community. Um, and that's what's kept VMware number one for a long time. It, there's, there's a strong sense of that. It's just more than the technology, even though the technology is obviously pretty damn good. Um, when you destroy that, that's 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 a fundamental shift right and i don't i like i can sit here we can sit here and say it and you know the broadcom execs and those guys that have got like a share price that's the highest it's ever been and whatever it's obviously working right. but from a from a just a sort of ground level perspective i think they've kind of missed the the essence of what vmware was and they right. might come to rue that um and it, it seems to be happening like you're seeing a massive, you know, questions going. Hey, what about you guys now? I think what's happening as well. Um, we're going to run out of time, but I think it's just really interesting to say this is that uh, there's a bit of a reaction happening by customers who are going, "Oh shit," you know, like two hundred a twenty x increase. I can't, I can't swallow that. But then I think what maybe Broadcom are thinking is that, well, that's a sticker, that's a sticker shock. But what is actually the total cost of shifting to a scale computing? Like, what is it actually going to cost you? Right. So. I think that's where, you know, you're you're getting those inquiries, and then, you know, what's the reality of the five hundred percent? What's actually translating to to, cust- to actual customers right. moving? We're going to know more in six months. You're going to know in more in, in like the next three to four months when you see your sales starting to roll in. But I think that's still to sort of sort of work itself out. The actual reality past the emotional reaction of it. Yeah, no, and that that's why, you know, when you look at some of the things that we've done um, since the launch is trying to make it easier for customers to make that that shift, right? The first question they always ask is, will my applications run? And they will, right? I mean, so yeah. that's, that's easy. Uh, the second is, well, how do I move them over, right? And we have tools and we're giving those away for free. I'm and, saying and, that, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. And the, the important thing, and I think sometimes this is missed, right? The same tool that we we provide to move applications onto scale, you can also use to move them off. Right. So if you decide like, oh, never mind, um, use the same thing we gave you. Right. That'll That's work good. fine. I love that. Anti lock in. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. It's, it, you know, there's, it, you know, it's like having an unlocked phone. Right. You can switch to any carrier you want. And, um, right. And then what we're doing is we, we're, we're providing customers. If you have an existing VMware contract that's still, you know, you got nine months left or 15 months left or whatever, if you move over to scale, we'll just give you that time for free. Um, so you're not going to lose uh lose lose that and then you know it, mentioning on the you know on the partner side we're also providing you know extra incentives to partners not because it's just like hey you know now's the, the moment time opportunity but but partners have a switching cost too right they have to learn the yes. new products and they have to represent those products and so we're providing incentives to them to say hey you know we're we're here with you right i just well, thought about all, the, all the, oh, yeah, i just thought about all the costs that they put into training and to certify oh, oh yeah man, it's, 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 it's significant it's, it's huge. Yep. Anyway, we, we, can, we can go about that for hours but hey yep. i think you, you know I, I think from the sounds of it though because you know you're, you're more than 10 years in, in play here you're a but basically a pioneer of the hyperconverged infrastructure right so you're so right. well placed to be able to have those conversations and offer an op- an option to these customers and an alternative that's pretty tangible and real right so then if they do decide to make that move it's 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 going to it's going to happen and you're making it easy so I'm I'm really looking forward to to seeing how you grow and how you navigate the next 12 months especially and you know what this actually looks like at the end of the 12 months so you know thanks for being on great history great pivot I, I love the story about yourself you know and where you started and Love the story about scale computing because I think it, it fits so perfect with a lot of people listening in terms of the time that they started in virtualization and you're still around and it looks like you're going to have a great trajectory going into 2024 and beyond. So thanks for being on. Um, this is a final reminder. If you like great things with great tech and would like to feature in future episodes, please hit the link at gtwgt.com. Uh, please tell your friends about the podcast as well. A bit of a new strategy here that I learned from other podcasts 
if I yell out a link, that may be not work. But go tell your friends about the podcast. Tell your, po- tell your co-workers. Tell your mum. Yeah, it's a good show. So that's another way to get some listen- listenership. I'm trying. We'll see if that works. But anyway, hey, Jeff, thanks for being on the Thank show. You. This has been episode 79. Thank you to Scale Computing. This is great. Things with great tech.